I'm so happy to be here again today with Haris Neofetal, who has been talking about some of his ideas regarding the monster group and how the monster group uh, relates to other aspects of what you might call a theory. He says not a theory of everything, but a theory. And recently, Haris uh, discovered some new things about this theory, and he wants to share that with us today. So I'm going to give Haris the floor and... Then we can all learn from him. That's great. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. So uh, allow me to share screen. Uh, first of all, before I, I I will start with my the presentation of my new findings. Let's say the latest findings and some of the of what I called. Uh, maybe even uh, some small breakthroughs or big, it depends. Um, but before I proceeding with that, I would like to show you this beautiful uh, uh, video um, that was uploaded like uh, 12 years ago, back in 2010, by uh, Mike Davey. And he developed a Turing machine. And I just wanted to showcase how quickly, how it, it, uh, uh, it works. Uh, for those that they are watching the video. And um, uh, what I, I, I wanted to clarify here is that uh, during our construction of uh, uh, the minimal order of, of, of each group, uh, of the monster and, and of the baby and uh, henceforth, uh, what do we have used? Uh, and during the last step, uh, the procedure was concluded uh, with us removing uh, that excess and uh, duplicate value. So uh, a Turing machine in reality, how they achieve this is with a, with an eraser. And we're going to see how this works. So allow me to share this. Once a program has been loaded, it is started from the console. In this example, the machine is running a simple binary counting program. First, the default starting data is written to the tape. After the default tape is written, the tape is returned to the first tape position and control is turned over to the Turing transition rules that were loaded from the SD card. While the program is running, three LED displays provide feedback. This includes the current machine state, the tape position, and a running count of the operations completed so far. Additionally, the four-line LCD display shows the transition rules that apply to the current machine state. Each loop of the Turing program reads the current cell from the tape and uses the transition rules to determine if that cell of the tape needs changed. If it does, the cell is erased and written with the new character. It then changes the state of the machine if needed, and the loop starts again. In this simple binary counting program, the binary number is incremented each time the tape makes a full transition from the least significant bit to the most significant bit and back again. In this example, the machine is counting from 11 to 16. Because it takes 50 operations to do this, I have sped up the video to save time. Okay. So uh, this is uh, how it works. It works with an eraser. And uh, in in our case, the of the of that construction that I've demonstrated, uh, the only thing that is uh, different is that um, because this emulates, as we said before, the let's say the first stage uh, of the synthesis of high um, of this higher synthesis of the prime values. Um, but um, what actually is, is going on, it's that in our case, instead of using the binary system as the Turing machine uh, uses, uh, with the eraser and the marker, um, and vice versa, we're using the decimal system. So this is why we are able to capture in our own M tape uh, these seven prime uh, M values uh, up to the point of the limit. And as I said before, if we lift up the limit, then it will go on and we will discover uh, what we call N, uh, N extended, that is, uh, goes to infinity. Um, and uh, allow me now to uh, make this uh, as a pass in order to um, basically start uh, uh, my demonstration of these new findings. And okay. the, first, the first one has to do with um, 
how we conceive, how I conceive, let's say, how I, I manage to understand and um, based on, on, on all these uh, new insights that uh, I have acquired, let's say. So, uh, um, Haris, can we stop screen share now? Are we finished with this film? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, there we go. Now I can see you. <laughs> okay, perfect. So, uh, what I was saying basically is that uh, what what I've managed to uh, to do is to make um, um, the following uh, um, progressive step. So up until now, this uh, theory of, of mine, this uh, TE, as I call it, uh, for truth internal, uh, that is, as you said uh, during the intro, is not a theory of everything, but at least it's, it's a theory. So uh, it's a very humble theory that uh, um, because it tries to explain something very uh, something that already exists and uh, such as the monster and the uh, rest of the uh, groups found in in group theory um what it tries to achieve it's it's basically uh, a novel understanding or if i'm there to add uh, and the novel understanding a new understanding afresh from the beginning so uh a lot of things like uh, that we are not previously accessible to me personally as a researcher. For example, uh, quantum mechanics. I have managed to crack this field, let's say, and 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 have some a newfound understanding that I can I can share. And uh, it of course started with some uh, uh, from philosophical grounds, but and theoretical. But because I am a, a researcher. That, that I value mostly experimentation. Everything in this life is an experiment and the more experiments one makes, the merrier. So uh, we are trying constantly to uh, push forward the envelope, let's say. And this is uh, the school of thought and the paradigm that I like to follow. And uh, so we start from the theoretical and we go to the practical. Uh, now, in terms of quantum mechanics, the first link that I realized that it was there, it was from the formula for energy that actually equals, uh, in my case, V divided by um, um, N. So you have energy equals uh, the volume, let's say, divided by N. And uh, in this case, uh, I would also like to make some clarifications uh, of everything that we have said so far. So uh, this uh, solid V that we are able to draw, as we said before, it's not an, an, an actual uh, platonic solid, but it, it looks like one. And what I mean, I, I can even find point it now to the actual state. So let's say the ideal state is the platonic solid of the octahedron. And the pre the pre final state is the uh, is what I'm calling V. Okay, so V uh, has it's it's the it's an octahedron that has uh, a base that equals to n. In our case, it's going to be two of the pairs of the twin prime numbers. So, for example, uh, when the n value is two then the n is going to be uh, 11 times uh, 13, that is q times p, and that equals to 143. So uh, by, by taking this uh, notion, let's say that um, the pre-final state, this is what I managed to get so far. I It depends upon uh, n. While the ideal state that is the platonic uh, solid, that is the octahedron, that is one of the five platonic solids, uh, that ideal state, in fact, it's a square and not a has a square and not a rectangular base that is equal to exactly n plus one. So, what does that mean? Now, uh, it means that the limit of our knowledge, let's say, now I'm talking in abstract terms, but uh, I think I, I will, uh, it will help me to bring some uh, clarity, let's say, in what I am saying um, and some veracity. So uh, if, when we start uh, 
uh, understanding that this prefinal state has a rectangular base that is p times q, and in the case of m equals two is uh, the n equals uh, 143, then in the ideal platonic state, the octahedron has a, a square base that is equal with 6m times 6m. And that is n plus one, because according to the formula, one of the formulas that I've showed you, uh, that is uh, um, 6m minus one times 6m plus one, and that is 36 times m squared minus one. So that is n, and, and if uh, that, um, yes, n equals 36 uh, times m squared. Now the next one, it equals uh, 144. So 144 equals 36 times m squared, and that is 36 times two times four. So, this is a clarification. Now, uh, I, I believe that this is a really important distinction. Why? Because, uh, and now I'm trying to uh, address the, the one comment that I wasn't able to address the previous time um, regarding my construction a method that is uh, using abductive reasoning. Um, basically, the, the value of, of uh, um, the, the total volume of, of the octahedron can be uh, understood only in terms of the M values and or the M prime M values, let's say. So uh, this, if, if V equals 144 M to the cube minus 4 M, then the volume of the octahedron, it equals 144 m cube. So that difference is only energy. The only, the only thing that, that is necessary to make the transition from the pre-final stage to the final, let's say, it's, it's, it's an, an, an equal amount of energy as the any, uh, uh, as uh, the Einstein's equation of mc squared. So uh, these two are connected. And uh, because they're connected, how can I explain this? Uh, this comes from computability theory. And there is a limit known as the Bremerman limit. And this Bremerman, Bremerman uh, limit actually represents the limit of our earthly computational power. We cannot go beyond that limit. And uh, this limit has a particular form. You seem to have lost Harris at this moment. So, um... equal to C squared divided. I don't know if you can hear me, Haris, but we seem to have lost your feed. So I'm going to put it on pause here for a second. Perfect. Okay. So um, I, I was talking that the, there is a notion in, in computability theory that had to do with that has to do with uh, um, our limit of earthly computation and uh, the power, let's say, of computation that we have with human stuff. And uh, this has to do basically with uh, uh, a formula that is C squared divided by H, where H is the uh, Planck constant. And in, as I told you the previous time, the way I, I parse reality is a bit different than uh, everyone else. Uh, my mode of thinking and logic and reasoning is quite archaic, as I said the other time. And uh, this allows me to, to, um, to perform one transformation that has to do with uh, getting the, the inverse of the, of the Bremerman limit and designated that as equal to n, exactly n. So by doing this, it means that we give uh, an expression to this limit of our theoretical computational power within uh, Earth, let's say. 
and uh, within uh, this system that we are living in. So um, what I am proposing is that uh, since now uh, we can define um, this um, Bremerman limit, uh, the inverse of the Bremerman, Bremerman limit being as equal to this n, that means that at that stage, we discovered this solid V that I am talking about. If we move, go one step even further uh, beyond this limit that is n, exactly one step, so it's not like a huge step, it's just a single step. If we just move a little bit uh, forward, uh, we will discover then uh, the, the, the solid that we call octahedron, the platonic uh, ideal solid. So uh, these uh, structures are both uh, uh, real, we can visualize them, we can, uh, in our imagination, we can simulate them, and, and also we can uh, even construct them or 3D print them. So we can start uh, uh, printing these, these shapes. And by extension, uh, we can also do this to the to to the prism that each of these two uh, uh, solids, let's say the platonic one and and this one that I am referring to, uh, they they correspond to. So one v v belongs to uh, uh, T v that T v is represents in this case the hypothetical total volume of the universe at moment m. And uh, what happens at uh, the exact next moment, it means that as we make the shift from this uh, transition, let's say from the pre-final to the final, from what is done to our level, let's say to the more idealized state of that, uh, we, we um, discover uh, this platonic uh, solid. So, this transition is, is not uh, uh, by by any means to be regarded as trivial. These two solids each corresponds uh, has a correspondence. So as I told you before, V corresponds to TV or ten or and so ever um, and so on. And could I could I ask solid... a clarifying question, Harris? Yes, please. Do you see this um, this transition? as being a, a one a one moment thing or a uh, consistent series of moments it happens uh, i think it happens independent of time uh, when things come into manifestation they manifest with that so this okay, is so that's I... what you are talking about the moments of manifestation yeah, yeah. of which and there we... are countless uh-huh and okay. uh, what I was, uh, just to complete my previous uh, line of thought, so this, this uh, uh, platonic uh, octahedron, this platonic solid, uh, can be written sim symbolically as V plus E. This is the important bit. This is what I want to uh, for people to understand. So, uh, Because you want them to understand that, that energy is that. Is yes, the... yes, yes. It's energy. Okay, so would that correspond to what Wolfgang Smith is talking about when he talks about the vertical causation? Yeah, it's because it's the individual conscious agent that makes the, the computation. If you don't compute, if you don't calculate, you will never find out. So you understand, maybe it's like uh, what, uh, um, uh, for example, lotteries, they know this very well. They tell you, uh, if you don't uh, play, you will never win the prize. So if you never do the calculation, you will never find out the actual answer. Maybe you compute it in your head, whatever the case, you are going to perform the calculation. If you stop at the, uh, before doing that, then uh, you will never find out. And uh, now it, it, it's nice what you, uh, what you ask there, because it allows me to to proceed in, in this philosophical manner that I also, I strive for it to be uh, really practical so people can uh, falsify me or they can test it and, and they, actually, they can actually build something. This is what I want to do. My From what I understand, uh, people uh, 
and uh, they can start building uh, circuits where you can get free energy. Not free energy in the sense that everyone understands. Free energy as I understand it. And as I understand free energy is like uh, you get you put inside a fraction and you get something out. Okay, so if, if, you, if you understand it, let me explain it in a different manner. I, I spend one and I get back 10. So you put in, you get back 10. So the, this is something that can be happening without, and this is the important bit of, of the whole of my whole philosophy, let's say, in existence. So does it? Uh, are you just using ten as a as an example, or do you actually think it works in tens? Because well, when you were talking well, about it, what what occurred to me is that this might, and I'm just throwing this out there, it might be an example of the Pareto principle, where the square root of anything accomplishes 80% of, you know, like the square root of the number of employees in an organization do 80% of the work. Uh -huh. The square root of the number of planets in the universe carry 80% of the mass. Yeah, but it, it's slightly, I agree with that principle, but in this case, it's it's a bit different. It has okay. to do with, it's, uh, for example, if we, I can, I can define a term like uh, half energy, being or or as I call it fuzzy energy being equal to 0 0.5 e so I can write it down in that way and uh, in the same manner I can represent uh, I understand that what we call matter or m basically is 0 0.25 e so it's one quarter of that and what I call t uh, and we had this discussion and I wanted to also clarify that because uh, t is 3m can, can be written as uh, 0 0.75 E. So it's three quarters of the energy. So the, these uh, ratios, because they are probable, it has to do with ratios and proportion and, and logic, basically, uh, in, because logic is, is rational. You know, uh, what, what I tried to say the other time, um, we want to take the, the, the nomological order and divided by the, the narrative order. So, and if that is equal to one, then, it, then it's great. And here, here is where the skeptics come and they say, but uh, you need to insert also the standard units. And I say, okay, that, that's no problem. I can actually, um, uh, I, I buy, abide by that rule because of course, it's useful. They are there for a reason, so they are part of the nomological order. So, you, you, of course, you as a scientist, you strive for uh, getting the the perfection. Let's say that uh, you want to uh, uh, galvanize things into action. So, uh, this is what I wanted to say. Now, uh, just as more comment on the fundamental nature of three. I truly believe that is fundamental because uh, it's not an arbitrary choice that I. I came upon and said, uh, I want to define uh, uh, T as being equal to 3M. W uh, what I did is like, I took the ratios from TV divided by V. And, and in, in the exact same matter, I also took the platonic uh, solid, that is the octahedron, and I divided it by N plus one. And in the, in both cases, I got uh, exactly the same uh, the same result. So uh, th this is uh, an important distinction that we can make these uh, clarifications. Now, uh, just going a bit uh, um, further, uh, pushing the uh, let's say the agenda a bit uh, forward. Um, as I told you, um, I I managed to think about energy in terms of that. Uh, vo the formula that volume divide, divided by n equals the Planck constant times the frequency. And how I get to uh, redefine again uh, this uh, Planck constant, in this case, I'm not, I, I am doing something new. So uh, what I'm saying is like, uh, what we must do is like we, in, in my case, I do, I am, I am performing an extreme reduction because the plug constant equals with, uh, um, it's divided by uh, 2P. 
So I'm just saying I'm going to make uh, count for uh, the value of uh, pi, sorry. I'm going to count, uh, I'm going to replace the, the pi in that formula with the natural unit. So I'm, I'm making an extreme uh, oversimplification, let's say, uh, but it's, it's useful because it gives rise to uh, the decimal order of things. So it's like a constraint that is enforced in a, in a, in a manner to uh, guide the search process and the quest for, to get more answers in, into what exactly this Planck constant is, because it's something very small. Uh, even the reduced Planck constant that is uh, two times, let's say, and divided by that is something very, very small. But in, in, in my uh, worldview, because I am taking the reciprocal of that, so I'm getting the um, an integer. So it's very important that we are getting integers. It has a one-to-one -one correspondence with what we are saying before, like uh, not all the real numbers are real. So the, the, the distinction is that some of these, they are fractional they are, uh, and can be expressed in a way with these quantities, with volume, with energy, with uh, M, matter, and and yes, uh, so forth with frequency and all of this. So uh, equipped now with this knowledge, uh, I, I, I can say that uh, H, this uh, new uh, constant, because it's still a constant, even though it's redefined, is redefined to be exactly what it was before. So just for uh, the integer order and not for the fraction, for the small number decimal. So uh, it equals to V divided the IM, divided the IM. And this actually equals to C squared times N. So that's for- Okay, for so a, let's back up just a second. You said V divided by what? D, v divided by M for matter. Uh -huh. This is the value. Okay, so for example, we have um, 1,114. That is the volume when the M value is two. And when we divided that by two, we get uh, 576. And when you analyze that, when you factorize that, you will see that is equal to four times N. That is C squared times N. That is uh, four times 143. That is the N for the M value. And th this is like a, a new way to understand this uh, age, let's say. Uh, what this constant is because it's it's very important. So uh, of course, when you get uh, the formula um, H times frequency and you define use this definition of the, this H constant that is V divided via M, then you get the frequency of M that is M divided by N. And that gives us uh, energy. So it gives us again the energy. This is how I came up with this uh, formulation uh, that uh, also uh, is to be found in, in quantum mechanics. Now, um, pushing, pushing this notion a bit further uh, and, and more deep into the, uh, let's say, uh, uh, the fine technical details of this, um, when, when the scientists decided that they need to produce a reduced uh, Planck constant, they did it for a good reason. So uh, this is what, what I am also doing here. And uh, it, it is exactly at this point that I'm doing this uh, simplification, let's say, by uh, applying, uh, by, by replacing the uh, pi with the natural unit. So um, I, I realized that I can, get energy by this reduced, uh, redefined uh, constant H bar. This is how they call it, H with the bar. Uh, when when I multiply that by omega or, or work, uh, this is uh, either the angular momentum or, or the work. And when, when you get that, first of all, this H bar, because it's exactly half of, of H, that means that h bar equals uh, two times n, so it's equal to c n. 
and h as we said before was c squared n and uh, this formulation it's it's great because uh, it, it, it allows me to make some uh, extra uh, calculations that had to do with this uh, fuzz interval that exists between zero and one, between two and three, and hence forth, but most importantly, between n and n plus one. So during in when we have this uh, uh, conceptual understanding of 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 an integer understanding, let's say, without where uh, we don't really have any uh, any any uh, place for uh, uh, the decimal part. We're just focusing on the real part. Uh, we realize that uh, we can start um, to parse uh, reality as it is, and maybe as it is ought to be. Uh, this is what uh, going. Uh, uh, to what uh, the famous Hume uh, question, uh, what is uh, the distinction between uh, uh, is and not? So um, this is what I wanted to add uh, uh, at this point uh, regarding the two values that have to do with uh, H. And just to take it a step further, we, we get to understand that uh, when we multiply, and this is a question that comes from quantum mechanics, when we want to calculate the, the energy for a surface uh, N, uh, what, what we do is that we can take N, we can add the half unit, and then we get to multiply by this H bar times omega and we get back the, uh, the energy. And in order to, um, how do you say, in order to uh, understand this, how, how uh, important it is, it, it allows us to have a new understanding of what exists between the intervals is the quantum. And the quantum can be understood at what exists at exactly the, in the half. So now I'm getting back to all this uh, symmetry that uh, um, has to do with the sporadics and uh, because it's very important. Uh, as we've seen in, in, in that illustration of the ram, ra, random hair contour, uh, the half point is, is where uh, symmetry, let's say, uh, breaks. It gets retained up to that point and then the symmetry breaks. So. Uh, this is my my understanding of of uh, uh, these two formulas that um, we can we can, can find. Can I can I ask a question here? So when when you said by your manipulating those um, those formulas, you mm -hmm. were able to determine that the quantum exists exactly at the half point. Yes. Right. So when you say the half point, it could be the half point between zero and one, or it could be the half point between two and three, or between or n, or n plus one, or even uh, in, in our case, because it's very important uh, to. to uh, I think I made a mistake before, and I would like to to clarify that. So energy equals uh, h bar times omega. But it also uh, it equals um, n times half times the charge divided by two n plus one. So if if you notice two n plus one is exactly the double size of n plus half, right? It's exactly mm -hmm. double. So this is the the connection you get the charge that the charge basically is twice the energy, is Cn. So uh, um, it's, a, it's a very uh, concrete uh, um, uh, quality that we ca it can be quantized. So the charge is what can get quantized. So wh what I am talking is like, I managed to pinpoint down in my system that is it has this uh, decimal uh, view, uh, this, uh, landscape 
this landscape of, of numbers and of, of qualities. So, uh, well, I guess the question that I wanted to ask, and maybe I'm because because I I am neither a quantum physicist nor a mathematician, so my question is probably kind of stupid. No, no. <laughs> but yeah. but if if the quantum exists exactly at the half point, and that's where the symmetry breaks, would that imply that um, that upon measurement it, it becomes one? I think. <laughs> what? Upon measurement, upon uh -huh. observation, it becomes one. Okay, so that was what I was going to ask. Is that the point of uh, the symmetry breaks is what happens when the measurement happens? Yes, until, let's say, until the measurement happens, when the measurement happens, it becomes one or another integer. Uh, it doesn't have to be binary like zero or mm -hmm. one. Mm -hmm. It can be like a, something with more carrying more information. And that is the decimal system. We are not machines. Uh, we mm -hmm. don't need to put reality only with uh, uh, zero and ones. Uh, we can pass it with, as human beings do naturally, with numbers. So uh, by by doing this, uh, by under, uh, having this understanding, we can even go beyond. So uh, I w the second part of what I wanted to uh, share with you is that I've managed to make the calculation for the gravitational constant from Newton, G. And, and I came up with a formula. This formula presupposes everything that we've said uh, so far. It doesn't break anything. It's faithful to everything that has been said. Do you and happen Do you happen to have that written out to where we could share that while you walk through it rather than just talk yeah, it through? Of course, of course. It's a little it hard to follow when we're just I know, I know. I can make, I can make it. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I try to be as uh, dis descriptive as possible. But of course, uh, allow me to share and I can also compute. Can you see the screen? Yes. Uh huh. Okay, great. So uh, here we get this uh, gravitational constant that has a very uh, fixed number, but uh, I am able to calculate, to perform this calculation in the following matter. Uh, G um, can be written as um, in, in the following way. The half energy, when I get the half, okay, the half energy, and I multiply it uh, by, um, sorry, here I have a mistake, yes. When I take the half energy and I multiply it and I square half energy and I raise it to the, to the power of T and I multiply that by a number N, that it doesn't need to be, uh, in this case, it's not a twin prime. It's just a number uh, where the distance between P and Q is greater than two, okay? Uh, and it's greater than, uh, we will see what this number is and why it's important. And I can divide that further with half the energy raised to the power two T. So twice the power of that. Now, uh, this allows me to uh, perform the following, uh, let's say, calculation. Okay, this is the... Apologies, guys. Sorry. Yeah. Okay, I have it here. Okay. So, um, Now, uh, I'm gonna uh, use a radio, as I told you before, in order to get the nomological order divided by the minor additive order and, or, or the opposite way around. Uh, it works in both ways, if it's equal, because if they are the same, in both cases, it's gonna be equal to one. 
So what I'm saying here is that if you remember, we have calculated the M value for uh, uh, the speed of light and uh, the photon is a massless object. So it's very interesting that the M value is fixed on, on M equals five. That means that, and as I understand it, it has to do with the thing that, uh, th this is in, in explained by the platonic view that uh, uh, whatever has to do, let's say with, um, um, uh, with uh, numbers, uh, it can be expressed and found in, in, in nature. So uh, it has to do with the theory of forms. So forms, a form is not a, a shape. So something that is massless can also have a form. So in this case, the photon that is massless, the fo its form, it's equal to five. And in this case, we are getting the half energy that is two times five. So it's 10, which is very convenient because we are talking about uh, this uh, decimal. And uh, we raise it to the, uh, to the value of T. And when M is equal to five, that means that T is three times M that is equal to 15. So we get 10 to the uh, raised to the, to the power of 15 times a number Q. In this case, this number, and I can explain further is the, this number, but it in this case is uh, 31 times uh, 2,153. I, I would like to point out that 31 is the, during the, the, the stage of our analysis of our construction, this number corresponds to uh, P3. So it's the P value that corresponds to uh, the M value that is five. So six times five plus one equals to 31. And uh, we further divide this by, uh, again, the half energy or the fuzz energy raised to this, uh, this time to the double uh, the power of T. And what this gives us is uh, this value here. And when, when we divide that by uh, the actual uh, gravitational constant, we get one, the unit, the natural unit. And we you see, we get the correct uh, uh, standard uh, representation here with the units. So it's, it's, it's a nice uh, uh, way, let's say, to perceive uh, these uh, constants and even uh, the gravitational constant. And um, now, if if can we uh, take this information and uh, build a bit further? So what I'm doing here is actually scaffolding. I am I am uh, uh, managed to to reconstruct and, and under, by understanding, let's say, uh, some constants, and then whatever uh, information I gain, I utilize it to move a bit uh, forward. And in this way, uh, there is the uh, also the constant uh, K, that is the Einstein gravitational constant. And this is equal to A times uh, pi times G and, and divided by the speed of light raised to the fourth power. Okay, so I, I can take this uh, formula for the, for the actual, uh, representation that I've developed that is uh, that is uh, accurate. And um, I can calculate K. So it said times pi times G. And this is divided by, here I'm gonna make a, a small modification because uh, it's CL to the fourth power uh, in my narrative. So that is uh, two uh, times 511 times two, nine, three, nine. So this is my uh, calculation.
Let's see. Sorry, sorry, this is yeah. Oh yeah, this is a, a calculation. Um, this is actually uh, the, a simple calculation that uh, we can perform. And uh, yeah, this uh, basically concludes what I wanted to um, uh, share to you at this at uh, this stage. And uh, just to add a small, uh, um, some uh, extra uh, pieces of information, um, we can utilize now this uh, uh, half energy, and we can realize that it can be written as as the as v divided by this uh, newly refined uh, reduced constant h bar, and I can use that in order to. Um, uh, calculate the gravitational constant and Einstein's gravitational constant to a, a high accuracy. So, um, do you want to add something? Do you want to ask me something? Or well, there's there's just so much here that I don't have the background to understand. So, um, I think I get the the general drift, mm -hmm. but I wouldn't even know what questions to ask. Okay, okay. <laughs> because some of those calculations are, um, they they just kind of go right above my head. I, I, I struggle a bit understanding where you came, where you got the numbers that you use in the calculations, because in some cases you seem to add in a number which to me, because I'm not knowledgeable, to me it looks like an arbitrary addition. Mm -hmm. But I'm assuming that you had a reason for choosing that particular number and not some other number. Yeah, I can explain you. Because this narrative uh, of mine is it's a bit different. Uh, it has to do, imagine in the following, in the following sense, uh, all these constants found in nature, they are very, very small. Uh, H, uh, the Planck constant is like uh, minus 35 or something like that. So they are very, very small. Now, if we are going to inverse that, we're going to get a, an integer number that is something that we can put on a scale and weight. This is how I understand it. It's something that I, I can compute with a high precision uh, calculator, let's say with many digits. So if it's something that I can uh, I can calculate, it means uh, I, can, I can actually go into the uh, to the internet, to the Wikipedia or whatever is my source of information, and uh, check um, what is the actual value for this uh, for G. Okay, it's something that is well known; is written in textbook uh, for many years now. So we get the latest uh, interpretation of that. In this case, it's fixed; is is six uh, something, six uh, sixty-seven or something. So we get that a particular uh, representation. So we get a number. It uh, sometimes it's, it's it's even a prime number. Uh, this is something that is very uh, I, f I find it interesting. Some other times it's like a semi prime. Maybe it's a twin prime. Maybe it's it's something that has a greater distance other than two. And uh, um, but whatever happens in that case, what we are actually doing is that we are taking that number. And we are multiplying it by by a power of ten. So we are scaling it up in order to make it an integer. This is what is happening. Mm -hmm. So this is what I'm doing. I'm taking this uh, number uh, that that exists as the value that I want to uh, recalibrate. Let's say my own uh, formulations in order to understand it uh, and also demonstrate uh, maybe a different uh, way to. Uh, understand it because you know it's it's not easy to uh, calculate the gravitational constant. This is what uh, my feeling is. But with this manner, because I am building on on small hints and pieces of information, like what is the m value for the speed of light? I had calculated the, the m value. It it breaks into three parts as the um, in the same manner that the uh, equation of general relativity breaks into three parts. Uh, it uses the same uh, 
uh, interchange of signs. It goes from uh, positive to negative to positive. So it's a very specific arrangement that is triadic, and it has the 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 following characteristic: uh, two of the of the parts of the set they are they are the same, and one is similar but is not the same. It's different. So it's the same thing with the triplets that I've used for uh, the construction of, of, of the master out of twin pair primality. Uh, you have P and Q that they are both prime. Uh, and you also have M that is also a prime, but is it's it's smaller, and it's also something like the ancestor of or the generator of P and Q. So there is a connection there. And when I listen to people like the uh, your latest excellent uh, uh, conversation that uh, you hosted on your channel with uh, between John Verveki and um, Michael Levin, uh, they have this discussion about uh, uh, this need that we have to make the hierarchical ordering in a very particular way and in not something like everything goes. So maybe the way we can do that is like we can move beyond uh, our biases by utilizing the selection bias and opting for what is already true and scientific and whatever. And when you start, when you depart from that vantage point, that vantage starting point, when when it where it will lead you finally, it will also be part of uh, what is considered to be uh, the state of the art. Or maybe it can even take you a bit beyond. Uh, this is my, my my understanding. Well, okay, so I had two other questions. One is, and I think I asked you this before, and maybe I just didn't understand it well. Mm -hmm. The speed of light, um, you use two as the speed of light because you talk about there being a fast speed and a slow speed of light. Where do you get that number two, and where do you get the idea that there is a slow speed of light as contrasted with the fast speed of light? Because when I look at to the uh, equation for general relativity, uh, what I look at is, uh, how do you say, um, it includes, let me just find it quickly, just to not make any mistake, right? I just want to have it in front of me. I'm interested in to the to the right part is the part that I understand basically. The other part, uh, not so much. Yeah. So. And, and this may be a question that goes along with that. Um, while you're looking that up, you can be thinking about this question as well. When you talk about dividing the nomological by the narrative, are you using that simply as a, a symbolic statement? Or do you actually mean that, that you have found a way mathematically to divide the nomological by the narrative? And... How do you, what do you see as the meaning of those two words, the nomological and the narrative? Uh, okay, so we're back. Now uh, I will try to address all the, all the different uh, uh, great questions that you uh, you said. So, um, okay, I'm trying to find out something. Anyway, I will figure it out. Okay. So, uh, regarding the nomological order, uh, I I believe that this uh, first of all, it's it's a nice abstraction. Okay, it's a really nice abstraction that, and even the fact that we are having this conversation, it's great uh, that it's uh, people they are uh, discussing about this. Great thinkers they are discussing about this. Now, uh, uh, 
the, it's not only the the narrative order first of all i believe that it's also the argumentation the order of argumentation uh, it's the order of uh, values and it's also the order of uh, what do you say uh, the order of understanding let's say it uh, like that so you have uh, different uh, um, orders but we can group them together and we can say that this is the narrative order now uh, one uh, what what a scientist must strive for this is what i understand they must be deeply embedded into what is true like what works what uh, uh, all these great people they uh, thought and formulated and after a, a long labor or a, a great uh, amount of thinking and if we if we designate that as the as our uh, departure point that means that in essence we say that the nobological order that is all these rules and all these formul formulae and uh, all these principles all these uh, um, tests, uh, uh, like the litmus test, all of these uh, uh, devices, theoretical devices uh, or construct devices that uh, scientists and researchers develop in order to experiment uh, and test a hypothesis and an idea, uh, they are of, they are, are of are paramount importance for understanding truth. And not only for understanding truth, I go even a step further and say it's also important not only to understand truth in, in any cosmic sense, but also to understand oneself. Like you, you follow a particular uh, uh, path. Why you follow this path? Because something leads you towards that uh, thing. What is that thing? It's love. Whatever you love, attracts your attention it captures your attention it's mesmerizing it's it's even if it's something that is fleeting like a, a sunrise let's say and by the line beach it's something that captures you and if you get the chance to uh, uh, put words into it then you get a point if you get the chance to uh, uh, write a treatise maybe you get a philosophical treatise it depends of how you are able to uh, translate it and, and now I, I just want to make a, a small departure from uh, what we are saying and just say that in terms of, um, let's say, uh, the ancient times, we have, for example, the Homeric epics. So what is the distinction between the two epics? If you ask me, it's like, again, one act of, of finding the differences in things that they are similar. Both uh, Homeric, both are works of Homer. The Iliad, it's technical. Od Odyssey, it's it's simply epic. So both are epic. One is technical epic because it has to do with quantities and and the chair the the chessboard and the rules and everything that goes on into this imaginal world. Let's say because. Maybe it's mythological, blended with uh, history. We don't know. It's a story. It's a narrative. It's not like a nomological order. Maybe it, it tries to describe the, the nomological order, but it's still a, a, it's a, it's a poem. It's, it's a lyrical uh, endeavor, let's say. It's something that uh, someone does, an artist create, um, because he truly loves this. The ancient Greeks used to speak for uh, the muses. Like it's the muse that drives you to do whatever you do. Uh, when uh, uh, we Christians, we believe that whatever we do, it's uh, with the, um, by the grace of the of the Lord and the Holy Spirit and God, uh, the Father. So this is what what drives us and what drives me personally uh, forward. Now, uh, when we get this uh, uh, fuzzy understanding, because it, it's something that. Uh, it 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 blends it blends let's say uh, the in in a recent discussion uh, I I've heard uh, Ian McKillan mentioning to John Bervaiki that it's the 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 ancient Greeks they used to have uh, a superior method of reasoning that it was above logos let's say that was mythos but if you if you take it to the to the, uh, that far then what you understand is that a legendary story is a myth. 
maybe it, maybe it's something that it's uh, 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 functional or imaginal, but it it has something of value in it because it got uh, uh, kept into the living memory of human. This is one one way uh, I understand. It. Now, uh, so when you get, for example, uh, the, the the latter part where of the gen formula of the general relativity, where you when we get go to down to calculating um, Einstein gravitational constant k that is equal to a times p times g which is the Newton gravitational con uh, constant, divided by C raised to the fourth power. What I understand there is the following. On, on, the, on, the, on the denominator, you have C to the fourth power. As I understand it, that, the, that is the full speed of light. So in my paradigm, I will just write it as in brackets, CL to the power of, to the fourth power. Okay, that's clear enough. On the denominator, you have this, this uh, term. You have uh, eight times pi times g. When I see that eight, what I see there is c to the cube. You understand? This is why I, I truly believe that there must be a distinction between the, the constant uh, that is c, which is must be reserved for the uh, even uh, constant that is two. That is part for the twin pair primality. For the speed of light, it can be written as CL. So in this in this formula, I I, I do see both constants, like the one that I am describing, that is just a, a, a fine analysis, let's say, of the speed of light. But I'm also seeing this uh, 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 distance that is C that is behind twin pair primality. And well, I guess I guess the reason it matters for me is that because I'm not a physicist, I understand I try to understand things in the simplest possible way for me. So E equals MC squared, what that says is that because C is such a very large number, when you square it, you get a very, very large number, which makes the the energy just massive if mm -hmm. from a very small bit of mass you can take a very small bit of mass and you get this enormous energy but if c is only two then that wouldn't have the same implications about the amount of energy that you would get from a small particle of mass does that make sense yeah it makes it makes sense but I believe uh, I, I cannot fully confirm this. This is just an insight from research uh, that is uh, currently unfolding. Mm -hmm. I believe that maybe we're both true. Maybe the idea is that it, 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 it is indeed transjective. So it, it covers, it's not either, or maybe it's both. So it's both the objective and the subjective view. Uh, that maybe the, it's uh, that is the case. So, um, so I mean, here here's an example of how that might work in my mind, and that it's related to something that C.S. Lewis talked about one time. That he was out in an old storage shed or something, and there was it was dark inside the storage shed, and there was a tiny beam of light coming through a little hole in the door, mm -hmm. and when he looked at the beam of light, it, it was just a tiny little beam of light. It wasn't important at all. But when he looked into the beam of light, it opened up the whole universe to him, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so in that sense, light can have these two capacities. Yes, and um, because I tried to catch up a bit with the physicists and what they are saying is like, I think my view is supported that there is a slow speed of light because the, the the speed of light is super fast in for for earth like it goes uh, i think it goes around earth seven and a half minutes something uh, seven and a half times in one second so it has to do with this seven breaking up again and and in a way in another way uh, when when we go to the vastness of space of empty space 
that beam of light that is traveling, it's like it's in inertia. It's like you are looking at a bright blue sky and there is nothing, nothing on it. You will just see that you are not looking at a, a diaphanous a transparent window, but maybe like a, a you know, like a, um, a painting or something like this, a, mono, a monochrome, like from Yves Klein. Uh, so yeah, it's something like this. Uh, it uh, at the vastness, vast regions of and expanses of space, light travels slowly, while in Earth, due to uh, I, I cannot explain due to gravity or of the Earth, it, it travels very fast. And uh, here, just a, another small note here, because I mentioned this uh, this trivia, because uh, this sometimes. These are trivial uh, things, but other times they are trivia. So, and some other times they are important trivia. So maybe they are correlated, maybe they are related. We will find out. But another thing that, uh, and now I'm talking about this, again, this symmetry breaking, the fact that we, can, we humans, we cannot easily uh, fault a newspaper uh, more than seven times is something else that comes into mind, in my mind. Maybe that's that's the limit when you are trying to push this uh, higher synthesis of things and you transpose and you do uh, all of that. Um, maybe this is what you get, you get a limit. And as what I told you before, I believe that this, uh, the inverse of the Bremer limit is equal to N. We can still go a bit beyond to N plus one. So it's, it's not that hard for science. And uh, just to add uh, something, something uh, that is also important for in terms of energy and the conservation of energy, uh, my, my whole uh, uh, passion, let's say, for uh, sharing all this information with the world and with the scientific community and with your uh, brilliant audience and you, it's that I want to, I want people to start thinking that maybe the world is, is more uh, uh, complex and beautiful than we even dream of. Maybe we don't need a virtual reality. Uh, what we need is like, maybe we don't even need to go to Mars. Maybe what we just need is to fix this planet and uh, this place. And one way to do it is to practically to do it like from a, now I'm talking as a sustainability expert. Mm -hmm. What we have to do is we have to cut down our expensive computation and go towards sustainable use of technologies. No need to perform these extensive computations that they require all this energy and this consumption and all this extra effort that we, uh, pressure that we put on the planet. Uh, what we can do is like, as I have done in my case, we can enforce a limit. Like we want to search until there. We don't need to exhaust the whole the search space just to find one solution. One, and maybe it's not a, the optimal solution. Maybe it's something that is gets uh, caught up into a, a loop. Uh, so it's a, maybe it's a, a low optimal solution. Uh, we need to escape all these uh, systemic, let's say, fluctuations and circulars of, of the of the natural randomness of the of the system we are embedded in and we call universe. And we start to, we need to start understanding that maybe, maybe a QBR drive can be used, can be constructed. Maybe we can find this dark energy and a way to, uh, to construct it. So I don't know, and, and if that is possible, then other options uh, open up. So this is my two cents. Well, so when you were just talking there, it made me think about the conversation that, that John Vervecki and Michael Levin had when they were talking about constraints. And John was talking about the two different kinds of constraints, enabling constraints and selective constraints. Mm -hmm. you, you could use the word limit. There's an enabling limit. There's a selective limit. The selective limits are those very hard cut and dried limits but the enabling limits are the ones that open up creative possibility. 
And so maybe what you're talking about with with your flexible way of looking at limits is that, that those are the enabling limits that open up more possibility. Okay, it's, it's great that you mentioned this. Uh, this, uh, this probability space, they call it dispositional space. This is how they call it. Uh, what, I, what I wanted to add is like, it's not only probability space, it's not only dispositional space, but it's, it is also transpositional space, equally true. So you get this transposition. So you don't need to, I don't need to take the whole tensor and start working with matrices in four by four dimensions. I can take a smaller three dimensional dimension that I can understand and I can parse and I can compute with my current technological limitations, let's say. That, that has to do with the measurement problem, basically. So the measurement problem is that we have very few uh, precision digits. Uh, when you increase the precision, you, you solve the measure, measurement problem. Of course, you need to expand and expand all the time, but this is how infinity works. You, you continue until you reach, uh, um, you know, uh, an end. And uh, because we are not talking about I'm not talking about the photon traveling to the vast expanses uh, of space. I'm talking about a, an individual system, a personal system, in this case, Harry's system. So it's like, it's how I pass the world and what I am trying to offer, if it's con in, in conjunction with what everyone else is saying, then great, great. Like uh, another thing that they, they've mentioned was like uh, with your discussion with, uh, uh, between John and, and um, Stefan, Stefan uh, Wolfgang, sorry, mm -hmm. it, it had to do with this, uh, uh, with a return to the uh, science and history, return to the platonic uh, understanding. And th that's a view that I shared. It's very useful. You know why I believe it's useful? Because for, uh, at least for Eastern Orthodox, the Maybe the religion is is uh, Christianity. We talk about Jesus Christ, the Lord, but uh, the science it was Plato. <laughs> it was about Plato. It was uh, Plato was before uh, 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 the arrival, let's say, and uh, the birth of uh, Jesus. And this is what I believe. And 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 allow me to have also a few, uh, even though I applaud. Uh, these views, and uh, even though I'm from Cyprus, and Cyprus is the Zeno is from Cyprus, which is the founder of the Stoicism school, uh, I am not exactly a proponent of of Zeno. I prefer I prefer the other Zeno, uh, the Zeno of Elea, that has to do with the mathematical paradoxes and how we can uh, get uh, the halving of the distance and all of this. Uh, but I also, uh, in terms of uh, philosophy of science, I, I, I like the pre-Socratics. I, like the, I love them. They understood mm -hmm. it. And if I could uh, get a, somehow in, in my dream, maybe, if I can get a time machine and go back, back uh, at a time before uh, uh, Jesus Christ, I will go to... Uh, Find to Athens to find Epicurus and hug him and tell him you were right. <laughs> he was right because he was the only one talking about determinism and free will. No one else talks about Yeah, them. you said Pythagoras? No, no, uh, Epicurus. Epicurus, he's the most. Oh, Epicurus. Uh, Epicurus, Epicurus yeah. oh, okay. He's the most uh, misunderstood of all of them. And basically, it was because he was the. His school started as a challenge to Platonism, but it eventually became a, an opponent of Stoicism because of the Stoics. The Epicureans, they never get into uh, fights. The Epicureans are more, uh, anyway, what I find in Epicurus, because it's like a proto version of Christianity for me, mm. uh, whatever he's saying, not the misunderstood version, the real version is like, you have both free will, and both the terminus. So only Christianity has both. 
And this mm -hmm. is the difference that in, in our science also needs to account for this free will that relation so wisely over the millennia and this thousand of years they managed to grasp. And we need to keep holding that. We need to make it as part of this hierarchy of values. Well, just today I was listening to a conversation that Jordan Peterson was having with Peter Kreeft. And <laughs> yeah, it's it's excellent conversation. And in it, Jordan Peterson made some comment about, well, they were both talking about how the universe is not strictly deterministic. And Jordan Peterson talked about imposing, that humans can impose our will on the universe. And and uh, Peter Kreeft said, I would prefer not to use that word impose. I just prefer to use the word add because the universe has its, with all the particles and everything moving around, they're moving around according to some sort of predetermined something or other for the most part. But then humans come along and we add our distinctiveness, our uniqueness, our individuality, as because all humans have their own way of thinking and doing, and and so, so we're adding in this, in in a sense, we're adding in a kind of stochastic, you know, in, creativity uh, or something into the system, yeah, and yeah, that yeah. keeps it from being strictly deterministic. So then you get both free will and determinism together. Yeah, and and this is a lovely, lovely. Um, thought that uh, we finally arrive at, at that uh, point, let's say, the, um, that you, of course, we can couple these two. And uh, what I wanted to, I tried to show you to, uh, to a previous episode, but at a good time, I have constructed a value. I showed a, a bit of a, sni a snippet, I think. I have constructed a, a value that I call Psi, Psi, basically. And uh, this has to do with, with the master and the, uh, that number of the dimensions that the master lives in and the, all the 20, all the members of the happy family also live in, uh, 196, 883. And uh, the, this, uh, this value actually, I constructed it in such a way in order to uh, one, understand the dimensions that the master lives in and the members of the happy family. And the other was to, how I can, I can, not I can, how can I solve, how can I understand the measurement problem? And and the reason I have done it was like, uh, I, I can show it to you uh, in, in another episode, let's say that one. But but the important I think about, I would like to uh, communicate and that is why I mentioned it, is that, um, we can perform this uh, mathematical gymnastics in, in a manner that makes sense. You understand? Because before it was like uh, a lot of technical jargon and a lot of, and all of that. But if we can manage to do it with only, with the integers and, and maybe a couple of fractions and a couple of constants, maybe we can agree that uh, a number like two or three, there are also constants. Maybe we can agree that what exists between them, that infinite space of uh, possibility is what we call quantum. Uh, when we go and we uh, make the observation, it's gonna be either one or, or two. So uh, we get to uh, also understand the universe in a, in, a, in a statistical manner and maybe even in, in, a, in a quantum statistical manner. Uh, that, and this is what my intuition suggests, that maybe is the way towards quantum gravity. Like if we manage to make that uh, leapfrog step uh, to the other side, maybe we realize that it's like the, that in the Aaron Jones movie and there is no one abyss, but there is something there and we can actually, you know, there's a plank and we can actually cross it. So uh, if we manage to test this uh, in, a, in a specific way, and, and, and I know how to uh, uh, suggest, let's say, to engineers how to do it. 
for me, at the end of the day, it all has to do about uh, circuit editing. So you, you create a circuit, you uh, you manage to pinpoint down the exact capacitance of the system for that circuit, let's say, and that capacitance will determine the amount of energy you want to get back. And this capacitance is like a, a very small fraction, it's like a fraction of energy. So you can get a fra for a you can get energy for a fraction of energy. This is something like maybe it will solve this uh, uh, crisis, not the mini crisis, but maybe the climate crisis. And you think that's intimately connected to the quantum gravity problem? Yeah. Yeah, wow. yeah, yeah. It it will allow us to make to bridge the gap with gravity. Like the only the only quantum mechanics understands the three forces, but not gravity. Maybe this is the way. Maybe this is this is why from one side I understand this might look like a theory of everything, even though it was honestly it wasn't designed to be one. It was just designed to. I just wanted to answer to. And John Conway, why the master exists, that's mm -hmm. how it all started. And, uh, but it kick-started a, a beautiful journey that in terms of theory of computation, I think this was described by by, by Kumer, a great mathematician. Uh, he said that, um, now, now I, I, am, I am not putting it to right words, but computation in a way is fundamental but it's 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 conscious computation. It's like it's not only it's not a brute work. It's not a brute force computation. It, it's not like a, a a random work of kind of a computation. It's not even stochastic or even uh, um, heuristic driven. It's more like concise to the hair the split of a hair of a horse. Or even even less, like it's it's very, it's 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 a quantum. It can be a quantum theory based on integers. Mm -hmm. Based on integers, it's, it's something that uh, it, it maybe it can bring some clarity into this uh, endeavor of science to bridge uh, gravity along with uh, into quantum mechanics. Let's say. Well, it sounds like you. Are on an exciting path, but you have your work cut out for you. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, maybe in the future, I'm having two or three people. After I did the quantum, after I did the uh, measurement problem episode with Brad, I had three different people contact me and say, I want to talk to you about the measurement problem. So I have three episodes coming up talking about the measurement problem. And maybe after That's we crazy. get through those, then you can come in back in and talk about the measurement problem in relation okay. to what you've discovered. That's great. That's great. Yeah. That's great. Okay. That sounds okay. good. Well, so, thank you so much, Haris, um, for all your work. And for those who have been following along, um, I, I hope they will comment and um, that we can make a little progress. Sounds good. Great. Yeah. Great, great, great. Okay. It was a pleasure. Uh, pleasure talking you to everyone. you, too. Thank you, everyone, for everything. Okay. Bye. Have a great Bye, week. Bye-bye. You too. Bye.